last time is we uh, were looking at the central notion of the idea of a family, a type index, let me write it like this, the central notion of a type indexed uh, family uh, of types. This is a central idea of dependent type theory. Okay, and we could write this down in various ways. For example, we can think of the family of types, let's write this B, B of X, where X sort of ranges over some other type A. That's a typical sort of notation you might see that looks uh, like conventional uh, notation for a family of sets. So this would be a set index family of sets. Or as we'll tend to write this, we'll say, given X and A, we'll say that B, sometimes I'll emphasize that there's an X there or not according to the situation, but it's a family of types. And we can think of this as a kind of mapping. We can think of this as something that assigns to each M in A. It turns it into its substitution instance, which is a particular type. Okay, so this is going to be a type. So it sends every element of A to a type. And moreover, this principle of reflection, or excuse me, of respect for equality or functionality says if we have, let's call it M and N, if we have equal index elements, at least definitionally equal index elements, then those should induce uh, definitionally equal types. Okay, so this is, uh, so these would be equal as types. And this notion, this idea of respect for equality here, is called functionality. Uh, it's a typical, uh, typical, uh, typical term for this. It's the idea that the relationship is functional, meaning that it sends equal arguments to equal results. Okay, uh, so, an, or another way of saying it is, we cannot formulate a family of types that distinguishes between definitionally equivalent indices. Okay, that's, a, that's a, another way of saying it. So, <clears throat> a fam so, if I, so if I had, for example, a family of types, we talked, to, we talked last time about, this is not working too well. Um, we talked, uh, see whether that works. <clears throat> Get this out of the way. Uh, we talk about uh, a family of types like, oh, one, one thing might be the sequences of length n. So let's say if we have the natural numbers, then I might talk about the sequences of length n. Uh, the sequences, let's say, of natural numbers, just to be like as uh, minimalistic about this as I can think of. So this might be a family of types. And so we're expecting, for example, so for example, based on our preceding discussion, that we would say that the types, you know, a sequence of length 2 plus 2 would be the same type as a sequence of length 1 plus 3 maybe. Okay, that would be the same, and in particular, they classify the same terms. Okay, so therefore, they classify the same terms. <coughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's an example. So that's a, the notion of what fun functionality is all about. So there's this respect for equality. So in order to, so what we see here is in order to even get this discussion going and to talk about these things, I needed to uh, have a variety of, of notions, okay? And the notions I needed are, I have the notion of a context. I have the notion of a type in a context. So this is the, for the sake of the induction, by which I mean we can have iterated dependencies. So for example, I could, I could have, uh, given a family of types B like this, I could then talk about a doubly indexed family of types. And then <clears throat> just to be emphatic, I can put an X here <clears throat> to indicate that this is dependent. <clears throat> and I can have C with X and Y being a type. And that would be a doubly indexed uh, family of types. So it's, a, it's indexed by elements of A and then by elements of B for that element of A, okay, so that it's iterated in this manner and so forth. So for the sake of the induction, we have in general a context, all right, a, br a bunch of variables here, and we have types that are dependent on those variables. So this is the idea of a family of types. And then we have the classification of terms uh, of a particular type looking like this. And then correspondingly, we needed notions of definitional equality. And our starting point was definitional equality of elements of a type. So I motivated the whole discussion by saying, well, even when we have only uh, when we don't have dependent types, when we have only, only um, 
uh, uh, s simple types that without any dependency is nevertheless interesting to talk about the equivalences between proofs of a particular type, but that this concept becomes particularly significant as soon as we allow dependency for the very reason of the principles that I was mentioning here. So that then induces notions of definitional equality of types. Sometimes I'll write type here and sometimes I won't. Okay, and then that in itself point-wise it induces a notion of definitional equivalence of context. Okay, so we have uh, kind of the, the formations and the equivalences written like this. <clears throat> now, for uh, when people study formalisms for type theory, they'll often play subtle little games and tricks with these things to uh, economize on the formulation. So I would rather not do that here because it, 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 it can be mathematically handy to do that, but it's uh, pedagogically not very helpful. Because, for example, you could think of membership as being defined by the reflexive instance of equality, and then you can kind of get away with only defining equality. But that's a little like too clever by half sort of thing. And so I'll just sort of stick with a uh, little still stick with a, a more, uh, I think, intuitively clear formulation. Even though I admit that certain kinds of uh, e e econom economies uh, can be introduced, and people do do them in the, in the do introduce them in the literature, usually for meta theoretic reasons. <clears throat> okay, so that's the, the basic setup. And the kind of thing that you should keep in mind for the time being at the moment is the notion of like a family of types, like for example, the sequences of numbers of a, of a given, of a specified length, <clears throat> or other such, uh, or various things like relations, things that come up as predicates or relations. So for example, writing MN in the natural numbers, we could have some idea of equality of M and N which I will uh, come back to uh, in more detail later, which would be a type. And the way to think of that is it's the type of proofs that M and N are equal. Now, in the case of the natural numbers, be because we tend to think of the natural numbers in the terminology I will use, we tend to think of them as a set, meaning that the elements are discrete. They're, they're uh, just sort of points, uh, isolated points in this, uh, in this space, if you like to think of it that way. And so what's going to happen is the types that are being considered here are basically either empty or contain one element. That is, the fact that they're, that they're equal is an instance of reflexivity, and if they're different, then they're different and there's no element of that type. But I, it's nevertheless important to think in terms of it's the type of proofs that they're equal, even in the cases where the proofs may be, uh, may be non-trivial or you know, may be trivial. In this case, they may be quite trivial. But even so, we want to think of that as the type of its proofs. And there could be other things. There could be proofs of other relationships less than or equal to and so on. So in general, you know, this sort of thing represents a kind of, you can think of it simultaneously as a relation or as a predicate or as a family of types, or as I mentioned before, as a vibration, as this kind of other sort of structure where you think of this as being some kind of big disjoint union of all, you take all of the, for each X and A, you sort of union up all the little B sub A's, and then you look at the things that are over a particular A. So if you look at, if you just use some set theoretic notation, if you form like some sort of big disjoint union, sorry about the pen, where A is in A, over B sub A, right? So there's this big fat union, we'll call that B, right? Then we'll define that. Then there's a natural projection, P, which goes down onto A. And what it does is for each element in this big disjoint union, it tells you which A does it sit over, okay? The pr projection is over which A is it? So if I give you an element of the big, the big clump, right? This big, the so-called total space. Sorry, uh, can someone help me with the pen? Here, this is not working out very well. <coughs> uh, okay. So if you take the, what is called the total space, then this P, this projection here, is telling us over which element we sit because you can think of these elements of this disjoint union as being like A and B, where B is in B sub A. And then, as I mentioned last time, if you look at the inverse image, if you take any particular A and you look at where it is sent, under the, the pre-image of the, this projection, pre-image of A, that can be thought of as a, what is called a fiber, okay, in the total space. So these are all the elements lined up here vertically. We write them vertically like this. 
which are the ones that project down by P onto A, on the, onto a given A. And for each choice of A, there's another fiber. So there's a fiber over A prime, and there's the fiber over A, a double prime. And that was the description we gave last time. So these are kind of two different ways of looking, uh, uh, looking at. Uh, so this is the, the sort, of, sort of fibered viewpoint, okay? And this is a kind of functional viewpoint. To think of it as a kind, a family as a kind of function, a mapping that sends elements of a type to the class of types. And this, you can think of a family of types instead as a special sort of mapping P, which is called a fibration. I won't right now indicate what the exact definition of a fibration is, but you can think of it as this kind of a projection uh, of this style. It's a good uh, rule of thumb, like how, how, to, how to think about it. And then that way, the elements of the particular thing are given by the, are given by the uh, pre-images here. <clears throat> okay, so that's, the, uh, that's the, like the framework that we're working in. And then what we do with this stuff is we close it up. I mean, the reason we're interested in families of types is remember uh, the things we sort of start with, right? So what did we start with? So the types we started with were motivated by logic. So we had one, zero, uh, and, or, or, you know, cross, cross and plus, however you look at it, implication, function space. Okay, so if I want to make my notation be reasonably consistent. We can write it like this, okay? So we started out with those things, okay? Then we observed that we could add additional types. There are things that are not motivated by logic, so they would sort of go on this line. So maybe the natural numbers would be one, and, uh, and so on. And then uh, maybe other sorts of uh, types might go in here for, uh, let's just say, the natural numbers for the time being. I'll, I'll throw in some other things in a minute, which don't correspond. They don't have a, a logical correspondence. They're, they're merely types. <clears throat> and this is the reason why people kind of think of the whole subject as being really type theory and logic is just a mode of use of type theory, which is Brouwer's dictum that, that uh, uh, about uh, a logic being a branch of mathematics. That's the way he would say it rather than the other way around. Okay, so, uh, so that's, the, that's the idea. And so we started with that basic notion. So now what we want to do is start populating it with other interesting types. And the first ones I'm going to do are going to, well, we looked at little things like sequence. So we'll have various, uh, like, sequences of length n where it's understood from this notation. Somehow I have to indicate that this is ranging over n. And then I could have other things like equalities. We were talking about equalities over the natural numbers. So these are forms of types, okay, that can go in along here. And those can be thought of as, as, as kind of base types, right? They can be thought of as they don't have any further structure. They're just uh, types that I'm building in, like the type of proofs of equations, the type of finite sequences. Okay, maybe this could really be represented uh, in some other way, I'll show how to do that in a minute, but for the moment we'll take that as a, as a primitive notion. We can think of it as a primitive notion. And then what we want to do is have some closure conditions. In other words, the whole reason for getting into this business about having families is to, uh, is to be able to do something with them. And the main thing that we want to do are what are called forming the general product in sum. So what we have here, there are various notations, but uh, pi x and a, b, and I'll write sigma x and a, b. So they're sometimes called pi types, sigma types, they're called product types, some types. They're called, this is sometimes called dependent function type, this is sometimes called dependent product type, which is very confusing because that in certain situations can be called a product, but in other situations that can be called a product and that gets messy, okay? So uh, it's again, there are terminological traditions that collided with one another, okay? Now, special cases of this include, if we go back to the logic side here, uh, universal quantification over a type, and I'll write here uh, P or something, I'll just write B, okay? And the idea here of existential quantification over a type. But we have to be a little bit careful, okay? These are, these are the kind of logical correspondences, those are correct. But you must be a little bit careful because traditionally, in for, like for example, in first order arithmetic, you consider something much more restrictive than that. We don't consider it over any type. We consider it, for example, in arithmetic, we consider only quantification over the natural numbers. And we fix that. There's a quantifier that is dedicated to that purpose, quantification over the natural numbers. But more generally than one can, can generalize that and consider quantification over other types, A, 
and in particular, it starts to quickly get, gets outside the realm of uh, first order logic or conventional first order logic when we start admitting, for example, function types, because then we can talk about quantification over, uh, over functions, and we can talk about for every f from n to n, and exists an f from n to n, which is outside the realm of what you usually consider in like first order logic. Okay, so they are like the first order quantifiers, but they're not exactly, they're a bit more generalized, but that is the, the, the kind of analogy, and I'll explain why that's a good analogy by telling you what the rules are for, for forming the sigma and the pi. There's going to be another issue about the behavior of existential quantification that will come up here as well uh, that is uh, known to be problematic. So these kind of uh, issue, these kind of correspondences have to be taken somewhat with a grain of salt because there are uh, many complicating issues to be discussed. Okay, so what I want to then do here is to start populating our type theory now, be more serious about it, and formulate what are the principles of forming these so-called dependent types. Now, I'll remind ourselves that we have a bunch of structural principles that sort of come along for free. I won't write down all of them. I've given you uh, references to the literature where you can look up uh, the formal definitions of the type theories and stuff because it would be awfully dreary for me to write out several dozen rules and stuff and everyone would go to sleep. So I'm just going to uh, point out the you know, main things that are important. So, for example, uh, you, can always, you, know, you can always use a variable at its type. Okay, so that's, that's an example of a structural principle, the, the, the use and behavior of variables, okay? The principle of substitution, well, there are more or less general ways to say this, but uh, one version of it is this, it says uh, if x uh, delta gives us, well, now the question is what goes on the right? So I'll cheat here and I'll write a judgment j, and I'll, you'll see what I'm going to do here in a minute. And it says if I have an m which is of type a, then in the instance, remember, these can be sequentially dependent, so I can plug those into delta, and then I can plug that mx in for j. Well, I'm a little cheating here because j stands for any of these judgments, right? So it could be a typing judgment, or it could be a type formation judgment, so I'm using a blackboard economy here to uh, you know, explain these things concisely, but really I mean a bunch of rules here, one for each choice of those judgment j. But this is the principle of substitution. So these are the, the fundamental uh, ideas about variables, right? That a variable is an unknown element of a type, uh, and uh, you can uh, give meaning to variables by substitution, by plugging in for them. That's what variables, what variables are and what they're for. And this is how we do it. <coughs> the principles of functionality say every judgment is going to be functional in those free, in, in its free variables. So here I have to actually write this out. There's no easy way to write this out other than directly. So let's write. Um, uh, let's say n colon b here, and if we have equal elements, oh, I shouldn't have called it m, and well, let me just call them m and m prime, okay, like that, then we're going to want to know, well, there's various things we're going to want to know. Let's look at a specific instance. Let's just look at the last variable. Uh, the technic technicalities are technicalities. Uh, the thing I want to get in here is that m for x n should be equal to uh, m prime for x n in m for x b, excuse me for squeezing, that goes there, uh, and the point being, by a similar rule, which I won't write down, equal instances will give us equal types, so the fact that I chose m for x b here is immaterial because that's going to be definitionally equal to m prime for x b in the way in which we spoke before. Other structural rules come into play, there are rules for weakening, okay, which I won't write out here, we talked about it last time, uh, contraction, exchange. Is substitution something that actually needs to be included as a rule, or is it going to be admissible? Well, I'm, I'm assuming I've defined it for all. I haven't really given that definition to you. It's right, right, right. But the, the substitution rule you wrote up, is that, does that need to be included as an input rule, or is that... Uh, that's what I'm, th so this is what I am not doing, okay? What I'm not doing is committing to some specific formalism. I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you the, the semantic principles that are going on. And then for, because of various considerations of meta theory, people formulate it in different ways, is what I was saying before. There are many different formulations, no one of which is right or canonical or best or anything. 
There are just different ways of doing it. So what I'm trying to do for the purpose of teaching is to give you the ideas, and I'm not committing to, like, this is a rule and that's not a rule, and this is admissible and that's not admissible. I'm not going to worry about that because I'm not going to be doing any meta theory. If I were doing some meta theory, then I would have to be very extra careful because I'm trying to cross all my T's and dot my I's. So I'm being a little loose. I, I, I admit that I'm being loose, but there are there are... You know, I'm being uh, faithful to the truth, and I'm, uh, and uh, you can look in the references I've given you for the you know various forms of the story. Okay, so we'll have weakening, we'll have contraction, we'll have exchange. I won't bother to write them down as rules, but those should be valid principles in one way or another. Either they're admissible rules, or you put them in explicitly, and let's not discuss why you do one or the other. Uh, but let's say we're going to do this, uh, and then I mentioned last time, amongst many other things, there's the respect for equivalence as well, which says um, definitionally equal types classify the same uh, classify the same terms and etc. Like equal things of this type will be equal at that type and so forth. So I'll just write etc. here because I don't want to. It, it's really too boring to write down every single thing. Okay, so um, that's the point. But the point I want to say here is that these are the structural principles, right? This is what makes the theory work. Um, this is the generic stuff, and mostly it's about the behavior of variables and, and the uh, notion of definitional equality. So in particular, whenever you have an open term, whenever you have some form of, like if this is a typing judgment or, or, or it's a type, whenever you have some open judgment here that has some free variables, the rule of thumb is it's a mapping that is functional in those free variables. Okay, that is the idea. Uh, we're worried about the pen. <coughs> I really dislike whiteboards, but you can't teach properly without chalk. Thanks. <coughs> but <laughs> all right. So, uh, so these are the structural principles, and they are primarily about the behavior of variables. That's essentially what is going on. And so, um, <coughs> so we have those. Those are like inherited. Those are for. <clears throat> Those are uh, the context in which we're working because they define for us what we mean by family, okay, this idea of functional dependency. Okay, now the other thing I would like to say is that there's another way of looking at this. It, it's the same thing, but um, you could also look at it this way, which is the, the origin of the notion of type, which goes back to uh, Russell and Whitehead's work, is that a type is the range of significance of a variable. That's another way of looking at it. Okay, whenever you have a variable you must implicitly or explicitly specify what does it range over. And the thing that it ranges over is called a type. That's the notion of a type. Okay, so in school, uh, way back when, uh, all of the variables ranged over the real numbers. Okay, and nobody ever, I mean, that was clearly specified, but you don't really write it down because everything is tacitly ranging over the real numbers. So here we're going to be, you know, specifying the specifically what the, 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 the range of significance of a, of a variable is. So there's a kind of like general rule of thumb. Whenever you have variables, you have to have types because they, they go together. Uh, it, it is the range of significance of that variable, and you must specify its range of significance. So uh, that's why all these things kind of uh, fit together in the way that they do. Okay, uh, good. So that's uh, the, general, uh, the general framework. And now what I would like to do is start, uh, you know, instantiating this a little bit. Okay, so I can say a few things. All right, so let's look at the um, behavior of the quantifiers. And I'm just going to dive in and do them as type constructors, and then I'll draw the analogies to logic uh, on the fly. I could, in fact, continue this whole uh, discussion I was giving you before, but uh, carrying it out in parallel starts to get complicated. So now I'm going to just do, like, type theory, okay? And then I'll make the analogies to types, as we, uh, to logic. And Steve, I think, will talk about the... Uh, connections with uh, category theory. The connections to categories are, at this point when you have quantification, start to become more involved. And it's a little hard for me to do that just on the fly. So it'll be nice to set Steve up for doing that. Okay, so let's look at, for example, the product. So this is the, like, in some way where all the, where all the action is. So we are going to, I am, admittedly, I'm starting in the middle. I will piece everything together in due course, but I think it's best to, to, to do it like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, under what conditions is that a type? Well, the conditions under which it's a type are that A is a type. Well, really, under which it's a family of types indexed by gamma. 
okay? Because in the induction, that's what we always consider. We only ever consider families. If this happens to be empty, okay, that's fine. Then it's a closed type. Yeah. Uh, it's n there's, nothing I, there's nothing I can do here. Okay. I <coughs> mean, it's... Uh, uh, I'm doing my best. You're going with this one for now. Okay. All right. So everything is uh, to be thought of as a family of types indexed by gamma. But we'll carry that along. So A will be a type, well, relative to gamma. So, of course, it's going to be a family of types. And then there's an additional level of variation where we say B has to be a family of types indexed by A. So it will be written like that. Okay? So if you hold the gamma fixed for a moment, like you could think of it as like a currying, uh, instantiate gamma however you like, fix that instance, then uh, that's orange. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'll put that in my back pocket. Okay. Uh, all right. So you fix the gamma and you say, okay, then what I have is for the fixed gamma, I have a type and a family of types indexed by the elements of A. So that's, and this is called the big Cartesian product. So this is called the pi formation rule. A lot of times it's written like that. So if you look at this by analogy, if you think of this now as from the point of view of logic, what I would kind of pencil in here, and maybe that's what orange is good for, what I would pencil in here is this would be a proposition and this would be a proposition. But if you're thinking of it as logic, that would remain being a type. In other words, in conventionally in logic, and uh, what I'm, this is partly where the, it, it's better to do type theory than it is to try to uh, relate everything to logic because in certain, certain, uh, in certain dimensions, logic has, has remained degenerate in ways that it's not when, it, when, it's, when it's presented from the point of view of type theory. And one of those dimensions is, in logic, you don't normally, in you know, conventional textbook logic that you look up, one never considers quantification over propositions because proofs are not mathematical objects. That's completely out of the game. So you have a notion of type, which is your domains of quantification, okay? And then you can form propositions or predicates over a particular type. And in certain really degenerate forms of logic, there's only one type ever, okay? Maybe it's a type of natural numbers, possibly. There's only one type, but there could be many if you have, uh, then it's called multi-sorted for some reason, okay? And then you have a notion of a proposition indexed by that type. But in the context of type theory, we just say, oh, props, types, you know, that's just like uh, a matter of your point of view, okay? There's no real difference between a proposition and a type. They're the same thing. So that has some consequences. It means in particular that the thing we're quantifying over could very well look more like a proposition, really, okay? I mean, it's a matter of how you look at it, of course, but it would, could have the form, you know, involving only logical connectives, and then it looks like you're quantifying over proofs. And the reason being, proofs are mathematical objects, just like all the others. Types classify all the mathematical objects, and that's what we quantify over. So, and passant, we get proof quantification over proofs. So it all sort of works out smoothly. Uh, the conventional story is a bit, thanks, the conventional story is a bit, uh, is a bit um, uh, contrived when you see it from a, a type theoretic point of view because type theory was the first sort of comprehensive understanding of logic in my, in my opinion, okay? So, okay, but that's what it would look like and then you would tend to write, if it were a logic book, then you would tend to write this as for all. So you would make the distinction that that's a type, this is a proposition and then you'd write that as a for all. Okay, so that's a special case of, uh, of the general thing. All right, and then continuing in the pattern of natural deduction then, we have to decide what are the elements of this type. So let's look at the introduction. All right, so let's think about this. So I want to say something or other is an element of this type. <clears throat> I'm also going to have to say equality and stuff, but I'll, I'll get to that. Pi X and AB, okay. So if you just think of your um, uh, set theoretic experience, then if I uh, look at you may well have seen, I'll jot it up here on the side, the idea of pi x and a, b of x, where this is a family of types indexed by a. That's what we're, what we're describing. And this is variously described as being uh, an infinitary <coughs> sequences, like that is a indexed element, so it's basically uh, B sub A, B sub A prime, oops, uh, B sub A double prime, et cetera, for each uh, possible choice of A prime. So people sometimes write it like that. Or there are various ways you can notate it, okay? Well, really what's going on is it's a function, it's a mapping that assigns to every element of here an element of the corresponding instance here. 
So the way we're going to write that is says, well, given an element of the domain of quantification, I expect you to give me, and let me a little, put a little x here just to indicate, a, a variable element of the variable type. Okay, so this is an element that knows about x, and this is a type that knows about x, okay? And then the idea is, what you're saying here is, this is a mapping, right? This is a mapping that assigns to each, x, each element little a in a, it signs m sub a, uh, which is of type b sub a. And the collection of all of those forms, uh, 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 if I put those all together, that will give me an element here, and that's a lambda abstraction. So this will be written lambda x a. If I wanted to emphasize, I could write m sub x. Okay, and then in that case, I would write b sub x, and it would look like that. So that's uh, the pi introduction rule. So the point is it's a function, and this could also be notated send x in a to m sub x. You could write it like that. Or you could write it as, you know, angle brackets m sub x sub x in a. I mean, there are various ways of, like, people notate it. But computer scientists use lambda, of course. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll write down, we'll write it using a lambda. Okay, so that's the introductory form. And then the elimination form, and this is a characteristic thing. <coughs> yep. Everything written where now? You're Yeah, so what I was trying to do is I was trying to say, I was trying to give us a little chart. We could write this in two columns if we want, two rows if we want. So I had, we started out with various propositions, and then we, we drew analogies between those propositions and types, and then we got carried away and started writing down a lot of types that didn't correspond to proposition, and then they kind of do again in the, in the way that I have been explaining. That's not, the, the correspondences to traditional things are not exact because traditional things are weirdly incomplete from the point of view of uh, type theory. Does that answer your question? As, as one what? Because they're not. I mean, because certain types do not correspond to propositions, and certain accounts of propositions, like you find in books, are only fragments of the types. Oh, why do I use that notation, you're saying? Uh, well, uh, as I say, because the quantifiers that all in the exist, um, it's, a tradition, it's a notational tradition. I mean, it's a basic thing I can tell you. I, I want to emphasize the idea, the constructive content of propositions as being, the, a proposition is nothing other than the type of a bunch of proofs. And so by writing it in this kind of notation of pi and sigma, stresses the, the idea that it's a construction. Uh, yes. Okay, I, I don't know uh, what, what, what further, how much further I can, I can take it. No, it's you know there are, as I've mentioned, there's a collision of terminology and notations that ever. Risen, risen over, you know, century or more, and I'm trying to make clear the correspondences, but what I really care about in my heart of hearts is type theory, and so I'm writing down, you know, type theory and then trying to draw the analogies as much as I can. That's the best I can do for you. It's, there are, the, the, believe me, there are some really horrendous notational uh, collisions that you'll run into that can be very confusing. Okay, what now? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Okay, that seems to work. Okay, so uh, so yeah, that's that's the well, that's the best. I mean, if it's not helpful, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to be helpful. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, okay, so going on, we want to look at the elimination forms. So we want to say, what do we do with an element of this? If I have an element of pi x and a b, what do you do with that guy? Well, remember, it's to be thought of as 
perhaps as a function or an infinite sequence or uh, whatever, whichever of these kind of notations you like to think. So what I can do is I can instantiate it. And by instantiating it, I instantiate it at a particular element of its domain. So what I do is I say, if you give me a particular element of the domain, then, OK, I need a notation. And typically, it's just application that you take the nth element, as it were, of the sequence m. That's a way to think about it. Or you can think of it as applying the function m to the argument n. Uh, it doesn't matter. And what you get back is a corresponding instance of that family. And this is the critical, critical idea here that, that goes on, is the fact that when you choose from this sequence a particular thing, n, and you plug that in, the thing you get is in that fiber. Okay, so it's here. That's where, where this belongs. And that's a characteristic, uh, characteristic feature. And then if we look again at those principles of definitional equality that I talked about so far, then we will get the, the, the baseline understanding, you recall, is the idea of uh, computation, these beta-like rules, which are representing what Frank, I think, probably called the inversion principle, the idea that the elimination rules invert the introduction rules. So it says, if I take something which I have explicitly introduced, so let's write it like that, and I then eliminate it, do it in application, that should be the same as just plugging in, in this case, n for x in m, and its type will be n for x in b, under suitable premises like uh, a is a type and uh, M is a family of elements of the family of types B, okay, like that. And this is the sort of beta-like rule, and this is, can also be called pi computation, if you will. All right, so that's, uh, that's like one of the basic principles of definitional equivalence. Now, I know that it has come up in Frank's uh, discussion whether there should be other principles of definitional equality. And for the time being, I'm just not going to go there, okay? There is some, I said to you before, the exact idea of what is definitional equality is a little bit up for grabs. It's not completely clear. Uh, I think that uh, Frank might have postulated for you a different rule, which I won't officially take because I have other ways of dealing with this, but one might consider as well, I'll just put a question mark, uh, a rule that says, uh, the other way around. This is the local soundness, so it's what Frank calls a local completeness. So if you put the, the intro after the elim, that that somehow should also be uh, a no-op, right? That those should cancel. And I'll just leave that. That's called the Eda rule. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will leave that aside for the time being. I certainly demand, at, at a minimum, the beta-like rules, which is consistent with the idea that definitional equality should be representing equational deduction as a consequence of the definitions or just symbolic execution. Okay? So if we take that as our baseline, our baseline understanding of definitional equivalence, certainly we want that. And this somehow is a, a different sort of thing. This is a kind of an induction principle. It says every element of the type is the form of a lambda. Uh, so in the same way that like mathematical induction says every element of the natural numbers has the form of either a zero or a successor. It's a little bit like that. So I kind of don't want to, you know, I probably don't really want to go there and introduce this as a principle of definitional equality, okay? However, I will admit it's not like hard and fast rules here. This is like, you know, I'm giving you some feeling, okay? All right, so that's the, the notion of the product, okay? And uh, you can see, by the way, that this, uh, I should have said this before, this corresponds a little bit to the rules that you would expect to see for like universal quantification. Because, well, in traditional logic, you don't worry too much about the forms of proofs. But if we said B of X is true for every X and A, so suppress this and just read that as B of X is true, for every x and a, then something or other which we suppress in the traditional accounts of logic witnesses that for every x and a, b of x is true. In other words, the meaning is just exactly that it's true uniformly in x. And then that looks exactly like a, a conventional rule of logic when written like that. And the same here, if we read that as for every x and a, b is true, so if we read that forget the M itself and just worry about the fact that it exists. 
if, if this is true and I have a particular element of the domain, then, well, in traditional logic, we don't worry about how to notate it, but what we get is the fact that n for x b is true. That is, if I quantify over x and I plug in a particular x, then that instance is true. And the truth of it is witnessed by this application. Okay? And then in traditional logic, because we don't worry about proofs as being objects of study, then we don't worry about when they're equal either, so none of this comes up. Okay, it's a pity, but that's the way it is. Okay, so once you learn logic from the point of view of type theory, you'll never be able to look at logic the same way again because it will look very kind of broken to you because it, somehow half the story has been completely omitted for some unknown reason. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that's the way it is. is a, that's part of the advance of type theory, why it's important, why type theory is important and has made advances in the field that... Uh, has not been made before. So uh, it doesn't erase very well either. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's that. So now let's also look at, uh, uh, let's look at the, the sigma type, which is, uh, you know, looks sort of formally similar. So the idea is this is a big sum. So we're going to say we have the sum over A of a family of types B of X. I'll write that here. And that mean, and that's going to be a type exactly when A is a type. So you have a domain of quantification and B is a type. So the, the formation conditions are the same. So this is sigma formation. Okay, and then we're going to have the introduction and the elimination. Okay, so the introduction is, what does it mean to have an element a sigma x in a b. I can write the x there if I want just to emphasize the dependence. Okay, so what is an element? Well, this is supposed to be thought of as the big disjoint union indexed by a. Okay, so it's the big sum over uh, the type a of each of the elements of type b of x. So the elements of that type can be thought of as consisting of an index element a say, hey, I'm over, uh, this is the particular element of A I'm talking about, and an element N whose type is M for X B. And in that case, the pair MN becomes an element of sigma, the sum of sigma X and AB. And this is where the, another terminological confusion comes up, because the elements of the sum are pairs. So then people say, oh, 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 so we should call this the dependent product after all, because it's a lot like product, except that it's dependent. And that's true, but it's confusing. Okay, so it's, uh, the terminology doesn't, uh, is a longstanding issue here about the terminology, but I'll just explain to you what, what that is. So if we're taking this big disjoint union of a bunch of things, if we think temporarily of these as sets, it, it's misleading. The set theoretic interpretation here is low dimensional, and we're going to be talking about higher dimensional interpretation later, but in the low dimensional setting, these are just sets, so this is a big disjoint union of a family of sets indexed by a set. So these are just the formal notation we have for, uh, for writing down the elements of that union. So now I want to say that this corresponds, and again, the correspondence, it's a little awkward because it doesn't line up with some textbook exactly, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But it sort of corresponds to an existential quantification, right? It's going to be the idea that, <clears throat> and you can see this nicely when you look at, this is called the sigma introduction rule. If you think of this as an existential quantifier, it says, if I want to know that, if I want to show you that there exists an X and A such that B of X is true, then what I do is I exhibit a particular A that's the witness to the existential. And then I tell you that this is, that that particular instance, that B is true for that particular instance. And so you can see the correspondence to existential quantification. In ordinary logic, as I say, the proof objects are suppressed. So the only thing you see is the term, the particular witness. So if you're working in arithmetic, that would be a number or something. And, and then you would sh show that that instance of B is true uh, by the rules of logic, and then you would conclude that there exists one. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the where that cor where that corresponds. Of course, the correspondence starts to break down as soon as you realize, as I mentioned again, to reiterate, <coughs> in type theory, A can range over more things. Now, the correspondence is uh, starts to really break in the next rule. 
next two rules, which are the sigma elim, which I'll one, and sigma elim two, and then I'm going to give you an assignment. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so this is what we, uh, what we do here. So what I want to do is I want to invert, okay, the introductory rules. I want to say, well, if you give me an element of the sigma type, I write it like that, what can I do with that guy? Well, the, the principle of it is that the introduction rule tells us what the elements are. They're ordered pairs. So if I put two things into it, then by the principle of conservation of proof, I should be able to pull those two things back out of it. Okay, that's the idea. So this is the uh, only, this is what I, so I put M is something that I put into it. We know that ultimately what I put into it must be in this form, so we'll introduce projections. So uh, there are different notations people use. One is pi one of M, which is A, and then under the same conditions, we put here pi X and A, B X, and then we will have that pi two of M is, and now this is the critical thing, pi 1 for m x b. That's very critical. Okay, so, and then we would have definitional equivalence rules, and if you don't mind me slightly just scribbling, I won't write it all out carefully. It's the obvious ones, that this should be m, and this should be n. And as an aside, the, the, uh, the converse of the local completeness would say, if you do this, you should have M, but I won't consider that here as a principle of definitional equivalence. I won't do that, but uh, that's a similar analogy to what we had before. So this is the, uh, these are the important ones for computation. Okay, now the question is <coughs> how this looks compared to ordinary logic. And the answer is it doesn't look very good compared to ordinary logic. And this is a spot where uh, the way I like to see it, oh yeah. Uh, so for there, is, it, is this like a traditional way of doing it? Or is it, is it possible or ever done to write it um, the separate way, like the, the CBS version where you say, like, let. No, I'm about to say. Oh, okay, cool. <coughs> okay. Second. Okay, so uh, so here's the here's the here's a collision point. So for me, okay, I'll tell you my point of view. Um, the logic can only be explained as a mode of use of type theory. Period. Okay, but people have tried to explain it without the benefit of type theory, and you get into trouble. And this is a spot where you get into trouble, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so suppose we think of this as an existential quantifier. Okay, so if this existential formula is true, that's the way we're supposed to think about it. Well, one thing you've got now is a term. A term that takes a proof and turns it into an object of the domain of quantification. So at the moment, let's say, just for concreteness, let's think of A as being the natural numbers. Then what you're doing is you're saying, give me a proof of exists X in A such that B of X, and I'll extract from that proof uh, a term, a, a number. You can't do that in ordinary conventional logic because the proofs are not objects. Okay, you're not able to even express, this is a non-starter, there's no way to even say this. So this does not correspond to a rule in conventional logic. And this one is only worse. If you make this into an existential quantifier so that what you're doing is you're saying, well, the M colon means this proposition is true, then you're able to extract from it another proof, which is a proof that the the quantified formula is true for that particular witness, pi one of m. I don't know what pi one of m is. For example, m could be a variable. So I don't know what m is. m is not necessarily a tuple that I know. It could be a variable. But certainly pi one of x is an element of a such that uh, this formula is true. That cannot be expressed in ordinary logic either, right? There's no way to say these do not correspond exactly. Now I would argue that these are the correct rules for existential quantification. I need a spot in which to write. I'll go over here. <coughs> okay. And, but they're not the ones you usually get. So what are the ones you usually get? And I'm going to ask you to derive them. The ones you usually get is something that looks like this. It says, well, let's write it as if it were type theory. So we'll do it like this. So if you have an element of sigma x in a b of x, or think of that as an existential. So if you know that the existential is true, 
then your reason as follows. Uh, you say, well, given X in A, given uh, a proof that B holds for that particular X, because the way you reason is you say, if I know that there exists a number with a certain property, I say, well, let X be a number with that property. And the with that property part means introduce a variable standing for the proof, okay, that you have when you're working in the constructive setting. And then you derive a proof of some other proposition. Okay, this is the typical thing, where that proposition is extrinsically meaningful in the ambient context gamma. And then you say, something or other witnesses the truth of C. And it's a kind of let. Uh, you can, there are many ways to write this, but it amounts to something like let X, Y be M in N. Uh, N, that should have said, excuse me. All right, uh, in N. Okay, it would be like that. That would be your typical, mo uh, suppressing the proof objects, that would be your typical mode of reasoning in a typical formulation of logic. Uh, your exercise is to show that that's derivable. Okay, so we'll, we'll do it like that. So you can get it on the basis of these principles. But these principles are, you know, much stronger. I mean, these are saying, well, they're saying the right thing, okay? Uh, first order logic or conventional treatments of logic like this have to talk around it because they have no way. Uh, this, this object here is an alien beast. That's as alien as alien could be because you're making a number out of a proof. And what's a proof? Okay, you see? And because of that, okay, that is a very important concept which I'm now going to exploit uh, by giving you a little example. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. All right, so that's the rule. So let me use these two rules to show you something about uh, quantification that I think is important. Okay, are you uh, with me so far? Is this okay? Okay. All right, so let me roll that up. <clears throat> so now I want to talk about something. This is, this is the, the traditionally at this moment this is the right thing to talk about. I'll talk about something called I'll put it in quotes, the axiom of choice. Okay? And actually what it is is the theorem of choice. Okay? And that's what I'm going to what I'm going to do. Okay? There are many ways to formulate what in like traditional so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to portray this to you in a form that makes the traditional accounts look bad because I think the traditional accounts are bad. Okay, so I will uh, explain it to you as follows. Okay, so the traditional account of the axiom of choice, there are many equivalent formulations of the axiom. I'm sure that you could rattle off a dozen of them if you want. But a, a, a very basic one is um, every total relation, binary relation, contains a function. Okay, so how do you say that? So one way to say it is you say every total binary relation, that's all write it out sort of in English, contains a function. So what does that mean? If I have a binary relation R, which is total, that is, on whatever its domain is, um, uh, the, every X is related to some Y. Okay? It's total. I'm going to select from that R a subset, which is going to be a function. So I can write it out like this. So what you say is, okay, if for every x, let's look over a relation over a and b. So if for every x in a, we'll write it like that, there exists a y in b such that r x y, that's totality. Okay? That's how you would write it out like in, you know, in logical notation, right? Uh, relation r is total means for every x in uh, r is relation between a and b. So between, uh, for every x in a, oh, y, yeah. Then I, I do this all the time. Then there exists a y that is related to it by r. That's what totality is. And what you do is the, the so-called axiom of choice says this implies that there's a choice function. That is a function which witnesses the totality of that relation, which can be expressed as saying, well, the simplest possible way. I can actually jazz this up a little bit, but the simplest formulation is you look like this: that there exists an f such that for every x in a. I choose the y, f, choo f is the choice function, which chooses the y. So this is called the choice function. 
okay, which chooses the y that corresponds to x in the relation r. Okay, so that's what it would be stated uh, as a principle of logic. Say again? Did I make a mistake again? F of x, yeah, jeez. God, I'm really terrible with that. Yeah. Okay, yep. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the way. So the, the, the statement is sensible, I hope. Okay. Notice, in order to say it, I needed to have existential quantification over functions because I have to have the, a choice function that has to, uh, is a function, so I have to be able to express that. Okay. So a lot of times this is formulated in set theory where all of the, there's really only one type. It's the type of sets. Okay, and then you work everything inside that one type, and it's a kind of cockamamie way to do things, but uh, it's what you do. Okay, that's the way it's done in set theory. It, it enjoys all of the, the, the deficiencies of any unityped approach to programming or to doing mathematics. Uh, you have a lot of codings, and it's really unpleasant. Okay, so the idea about uh, type theory is to just bring out, uh, bring out the structure which is there rather than try to hide it. Okay, so here I do that. I bring out the structure that's there by being explicit about the typing. Okay? So I have this. So as you very well know, no matter how the variations of how you formulate this, this is postulated as an axiom of, for example, set theory. Okay? And, and it's known that it has to be postulated as an axiom by a very complicated argument, which says that uh, it's independent of all of the other axioms of set theory. So you really have to uh, you know, postulate it out, outright. But it's a weird thing because, and people find it questionable, because it has existential force, right? It tells us that certain things exist which, so to speak, otherwise don't exist. In other words, if you write down the words, uh, the rules of set theory, and you have a, a, a notion of function that arises from the idea of power set and da 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 and you write it all down and everything looks really good to you, and then you suddenly realize that you've missed some important functions. And so the way you do it in set theory is you say, oh, the hell with it. You just postulate it outright of whole cloth. You just say, uh, we'll throw that one in there too. Okay? And that's the axiom of choice. And that's what you do. Well, that's what people do. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it works for some value. It works. So the thing I want to point out here is, though, is that in the constructive setting, it doesn't need to be an axiom. It's actually, it's actually a theorem. And I think it's helpful. I, I, this is a person that's... What I'm going to do next is a purely psychological move that may be helpful or not helpful, which is to think of this as a construction inside of type theory. So it says, if you, I'm going to write down a function that is given an element of the big disjoint union. And what you want to do is you want to think of it like this. Okay? So it's given this construction. It's given an element of this disjoint union as an argument. Okay? And then it wants to deliver back, it wants to produce an element of this disjoint union. Now, all I'm doing is changing the notation. I am, but I'm trying to stress the constructive reading of this. That's why I'm doing that. Okay? If you don't like it, then just ignore this line. It's the same as the previous one. Okay. All right. Oh, did I screw it up again? What did I do now? <coughs> Uh, too many people talking at once. Oh, yeah, that's a pi x and a. Sigma, yeah. It's weird, I'll tell you. It's hard to get these things right when you're up at the board. Okay, so, okay, so that's, uh, that's a restatement of what I'm going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to show you there exists a term m, okay? And I'm going to tell you what that term is, okay? And therefore, I'm going to give you a proof, okay, that this is a theorem. That's what I'm doing. So how do I do that? What I'm going to do is I'm going to define M in sort of the only way you possibly can. So what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to take in as an argument a proof, let's call it T, just because that's what I happen to think of, a proof T that a relation is total. You see, I get the proof as argument. See, that's what's really slick and clever about all of this, okay? Look, you're saying to me, this implies that. When you say this implies that, it means that you have a way of transforming a proof of this into a proof of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down that code. Okay, I'm going to write down a function lambda that takes in a proof of the totality. And I want to emit, I want to get out of this thing a function. So I'm going to write down here a pair consisting of a function and a proof that works like that. So I need to write down a function here of type A or B. So this will be written lambda x and A something, 
okay? And then this will be a proof that for every X in A, something or other holds. So this will have to be a lambda, and then this will be something. Will get filled in here. Like, we agree that that's pretty much what you have to do, right? <clears throat> Is I have to, I'm going to use T in here somewhere, obviously, but, uh, but this guy has to be a function, right? There's an existential quantifier here, so I've got to show you the function. I'm going to write that down. And then I have to give you a proof, which is a function because it's a for all statement. It's a pi. Okay, so I can write that down. So what do I do? So, well, if you claim to me, so I, what do I want to do? I want to say, given x and a, I want to use this information t to extract an element of b in such a way that b will be related to, uh, uh, that that extracted element will be related to a. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. Well, that's pretty damn obvious because I'm given that for every x and a, there is a b. So what I'll do is I'll just take, take t, uh, oops, excuse me, take, uh, yes, take uh, uh, pi 1 of t of x. Did I do that right? Okay, I think I do pi 1 of, pi 1 of t of x. Because if I take t, which is a proof of the totality, that's why I call it t, of the relation, and I give it the particular x, it emits... Right? The assumption, the proof, the proof emits a witness and a proof that it's related to R, X is related to that witness by R. So let's pull that back out. That's pi 1 T of X. And then what do I do over here? Well, what I do over here is I want to prove that for every X and A that they're related. Well, what do I do there? Well, that's just pi 2 of T of X if I didn't make a mistake. Why? Because the type of pi 2 of t of x, remember, is substitute pi 1 of t of x in for uh, y in rxy, which is exactly what I want. In other words, I want r of x, pi 1 of t of x, and pi 1 of t of x is the result of applying this guy to x. And I believe I am done. Okay? And that is, uh, if I didn't screw it up, that's a correct proof term. So this should be called the theorem of choice. Okay? And that's in, this is a, <coughs> a very remarkable thing. What makes this work? Okay? The key is that proofs are mathematical objects. This is what I said to you in the beginning, the very beginning. Well, logic is if people matter. We start out with proofs. We treat proofs as, as objects in our theory that I'm able to extract. I have T of X as a proof, and I extract an object from the proof. So this is extract the witness from the proof. So what's happening in the usual formulations of the axiom of choice is you don't have access to the proof. So you're supposed to get the F out of nowhere at all. Okay, you're supposed to, the F has to magically appear for no good reason whatsoever because there's no way to get at what that F is because there's no way to examine the hypothesis, which is a proof. When you have the proof objects available, you just hack around with them and it becomes a theorem. So the theory is completely self-sufficient and self-contained and works for general reasons. It doesn't require any kludges, okay, to make it work. I sort of view the axiom of choice in sets as a kludge. Okay, that's what, what's happening. You wrote a whole bunch of code and you erected this big apparatus and then something doesn't work, so you kludge in a little fix. Okay, so that's what you do. So it's a kludge. So here, uh, it's not. It works for general reasons. So another way of saying this is, which is <coughs> impli <coughs> implicit in what I'm saying is, the only way in a constructive setting to prove, and this is a little more subtle, I hope I can get this across. Another way of interpreting what's going on here is, the only way to prove the totality of a relation in a constructive setting is to exhibit a function. Why? Let's see if I can tell you why. In other words, what I'm really saying here is, implicit in the proof of totality is a function. And I'm going to make that function explicit. That's what, what it is saying. So why is there a function implicit in the proof of totality? Exactly because the rules of quantification tell us that a proof of a universal quantifier has to be functional in X. Why? Because here, 
you're going to give me a proof uniformly in X, and by the principles of structural equality, this respects equality in the domain. So this defines a mapping. It's a function. So the proof has to be a function that takes X, and for any X, gives us, as a function, this ordered pair. Okay? So the point is, is that in order to prove for all exists, you must, when you write the proof, implicit in the argument, must be a functional choice. You must have made that choice already. And all this is doing is extracting from the proof the choice you already made. Okay? So that's the, that's the critical idea. That's what's really going on. Now, there's another even more beautiful idea going on, which we, I think Steve Audi will talk more about, is that we can interpret types as kind of topological spaces. And then what is happening with the universal quantification is a continuous dependency of the choice of the pair here as a function of x, so that this will intrinsically come out as a continuous function. There will be no discontinuities. Okay? And, in fact, one of the beauties about type theory is that the type theory is set up in such a uniform and smooth way that you can consistently interpret the entire thing as speaking about continuous functions over topological spaces. And this has an enormous significance. And we'll, uh, we'll say a little bit more about that later. But it's intrinsic in the constructivity. It's the idea, the constructive ideas that I'm, that I'm explaining to you are what make that whole engine work, okay? And it's really important to under, understand that. So I want to emphasize, at least here, the constructivity, and we'll get back to the continuity and topological interpretation later and its relation to homotopy theory. We'll get to that. Okay, so uh, questions about the, the, uh, the so-called axiom of choice. Yes? Say again? What Pi1 is doing is extracting of the existential quantifier from a proof because T is a proof. I mean, in type theory, I've said over and over, there's no distinction between pr proofs and not proofs. But if we think of it, I wanted to draw you through it by thinking of it as logic. So if I think of this as logic, <coughs> then T should be thought of as a proof of a, of a, all, a Pi2 sentence for all exists. Okay? And then what I'm doing is I'm writing down a term of a type. Okay? So maybe this is n arrow n. Like think of a and b as both being the natural numbers if you like. So I'm writing down a particular natural number that is obtained by running the projection on a proof. That whole concept is completely non-existent in first order logic and the usual textbook accounts of logic. Look at any of them. There isn't a single one. Okay? Type theory is the only one that gives pride of place to proofs. And that is a, is a thing of beauty. It is the most gorgeous intellectual idea that I know. Uh, and its implications are dramatic. Yes? Uh, sorry. Sometimes I think um, people prefer to not have the actual choice. In well, in set theory, they do, but that's because of the problems of set theory. I mean, okay, so <coughs> that benefit yeah, of is the only thing I know, and it's, the, as far as I know, the people, the people who you know, sort of say don't want it, other than people doing meta theory or like trying to relate various axioms to each other and stuff. Let's forget about that for a minute. Very practice. The only reason people would say they don't want it is because it's a bald existence statement that has no justification whatsoever. Okay, you just say. There exists such a function, period. It's a kludge. I mean, it's a recognition of the fact that it's a kludge. Basically, everybody knows it's a kludge. And some people will write out, I can't get this open, for some, and some people will write out uh, in their papers whether they relied on that kludge or not because they sort of feel guilty, in my opinion. It's never been comfortable, okay? <clears throat> but the, the problem is the set theoretic foundation they don't really make much sense. Okay, and in the long run, that'll all go away. Okay. Can you omit extracting the missing of these? Can you omit extracting the missing of these? Yes, in the, in the formulation I've given here, you can because, uh, if I can find the board, this is how I axiomatize the sigma time, is that the elimination form extracts it. And I'm strongly emphasizing that this is, uh, you know, an unusual feature of type theory. 
it's only possible because you're in this setting of type theory that you can even entertain the notion. That's what's, uh, that's the, that's the way to think about it here. Okay. So that's what's uh, going on with uh, sigma and pi types. And this is a very good example, okay, about sigma and pi. <coughs> there are various ways to generalize this. You can generalize it to allowing a dependency here, in which case this would become a pi. So you can do that. That's a minor generalization. Okay, you could, you could do that. I thought I would do something simple, first of all. Okay, so that's certainly a form. And there are many equivalent reformulations uh, of, uh, of this that can be written down and proved. Okay, so good. Another thing you might do is, if you only had this as your elimination form for sigmas, uh, you will fail in trying to give a proof of the axiom of choice. Try to do it, okay, and see why it doesn't work. <coughs> okay. Well, yes, the whole theory is constructive. I mean, uh, well, okay, that, you know, that's a little bit hard to answer because c classical logic is a mode of use of constructive logic in which I postulate as an axiom that all, pr all pre pr uh, predicates are, all, all propositions are decidable. So in that sense, it's perfectly classical. It's just that uh, when you do something in classical logic, you're using a kludge. Well, the way I would say it is a heuristic assumption. There's a heuristic assumption that it can be helpful to someone. Like I said, if you think about Newton's method, Newton's method is a really good algorithm, but for the fact that you can't actually compare real numbers and decide, tell whether they're one is less than the other or equal to zero. Okay? So you make a heuristic assumption. You say, let's work under the convenient assumption that the real numbers are you know, atoms that are discrete, that we can compare and treat them like uh, data, and now let's work under that assumption. That's what, and then the justification for Newton method is exactly that. Okay. Yes. If intuitionistic logic is formulated as type theory. <laughs> okay. I know you're finding that I know. I'm trying okay. My explanations are are partly based on the assumption that you've seen other treatments of logic. I don't know whether you have actually. Okay. If you look in the textbook treatment of even intuitionistic logic, it is not done like this. And then it's a Okay, it doesn't work properly. What's that? You won't be able to do this. This move will not be available. Okay, so if you took uh, a version of logic, if you tried to write down, so here's the exercise. If you tried to write down the rules for a kind of first order logic, let's say a multi sort of first order logic, even a single sort of first order logic, where you quantify over one or more times, and you write those rules down, one of the rules you'll write down is the one the left hand board in orange. Okay, but that's what it will look like in the ordinary textbook formulation of logic. You will not be able to carry out the derivation. Because it's broken. <laughs> because it's broken. Okay? Because you cannot fully express the inversion principle. The, the, the idea is that the rules I've given here fully express the ones that are now obscured on the board, the signal rules, <coughs> are, are fully expressed. They convert the introductory, introductory rules. That is the proper expression. You're saying that the elimination rules that we use are broken. Are not Yes, they're broken. Yes. But they're, they're, in, they're insufficient. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm saying. Right. And the reason is, in order to express them properly, requires a radical move. You have to change the way in which logic is done so that objects, the proofs become objects of the theory. And then you can formulate logic properly. And this is what Brouwer was saying back in the 30s, that Logic is just a branch of mathematics, whereas everyone up to that point was saying you derive mathematics from the principles of logic. Just to make sure I understood, 
Yes, you will be able to, but you, the conventional formulation will not be, as they say, locally sound, locally complete. That's the point. Okay. They don't fully express the inversion principle that the introduction of eliminations are inverses of one another. And in order to express it properly, you must have uh, proof that it's not Okay? Yeah. We can give a computational meaning to classic of what it expresses as the power of proof of the value by many informations. So we could derive a similar form to classical of the The change you're speaking about is not moving for classical of the any of this logic in two periods. Because in, in that period, yes. I agree, yes, exactly, yes. I agree, yes, I agree with that. I, I'm trying to make the argument over and over that really the subject matter is type theory. Okay. And people have approximated type theory in various ways, like more traditional formulations of logic. Now we understand that it should be understood, that it should be viewed as a just a branch of type theory. That's a lot of reasons that people do not like the acting choice is that it implies limited results. But some of these limited results, such as the bonus parts paired off, if we look at the proof, we'll see that they're pretty constructive other than an application of the acting choice. Right. So does this, so does this mean that the bonus parts are paired off hold the construct one? Uh, I'd have to think about that. I don't know the answer to you straight off the top of my head. Good question. <coughs> Other question, yes. Um, can you, here's, I think your third remark on what was going on behind the scenes is that secretly the assumptions are continuous functions between the spaces, right? The assumptions were continuous functions between a lot of mm -hmm. Could you explain to me the point that, you know, what, that, like why that's easy for doing the acting of choice? Or is it oh, I just wanted to point out that the, if, if, if there's something even more, I was trying to make the analogy that the idea is that not only is there a functional dependency here, but I can interpret it also as a continuous function. And it still works. In which case, this will be a continuous function between topological spaces. And I'm not going to develop that idea further right now, but it will come up later in the course of the summer school. Okay. All right. I just wanted to like be provocative and say, here are some things coming okay, that are very important to what we're doing. Okay. But it's all in the idea that uh, proofs are objects of the theory. There, that is the most important idea. Okay? And that's the, the central thing that distinguishes my view, that distinguishes type theory, and that makes many, many, many things possible. So, and you know, we'll look at other applications of this idea as we go along. Okay? <coughs> okay, let me get my bearings. I need to figure out the right. I know what I wanted to do next. Okay. So uh, before we go to lunch, what time am I supposed to finish, somebody? Now. now. <coughs> okay, uh, I can pick this up next time then. Uh, what I want to do is I was going to now introduce the natural numbers finally. <coughs> and the reason is, is that I kept delaying it because to do it properly requires the apparatus of dependent types. And so you have this pedagogical problem about where do you start? So uh, I'm now actually in a good position to define the natural numbers. So what I will do is I'll do that, and then I will talk about, come back to these issues of equality, and then I will talk about uh, what are called growth and deke universes and uh, universes of uh, propositions, and, uh, and you know, go from there. Okay? So that's what's, uh, what's going to be happening. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat>